So, and this is an important um, presentation in terms of content and information. So we're going to see if this works. Um, so if you fall asleep, well, I'll we'll send you the link and you can watch it again. Um, not that that's likely. Well done for not sitting in the front rows, by the way. It's all a bit too close otherwise, uh, even with uh, your glasses. Now, Jackie largely is going to talk through... Hi, Helen, come and join us. Nice to see you. Um, Jackie's going to talk through um, A-levels and the way we deliver them here. Chris, in a while, is going to introduce his role as head of sixth form. There's a chance for you to meet Sharon Ormark, if you don't know Sharon already, who's also here, who's in charge of careers and further education, and it's wonderful. Um, I have been asked to start off introducing, but also telling you a little bit about the distinction between some of the other curricula there are for the sixth form. Because A-levels aren't the only thing. There are other things out there that some of you may be curious about. The International Baccalaureate, for a start. Um, and I have a lot of experience of that. Ten, twelve years ago, I was head of English at the British school in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, which was one of the flagship IB schools in the world. It's an amazing place. So I, I know a little bit about it. And also, um, up in Blackpool, Russell, where I was the deputy head, deputy ed, no H in there, up there, um, we, we did both IB and A levels. So I've got a <coughs> interesting point of comparison. There are also something called the pre-U qualifications, um, and we won't linger on those, possibly. But if you have any questions about those, um, Chris examines, or has done, uh, the pre-U, and we know quite a lot about them. The IB, very briefly. The IB is really good. Um, what I like most about it is the fact that it's got a really coherent philosophy. Now, if you read the International Baccalaureate Organization's mission statement, it's all about internationalism, and it's pretty wonderful, actually. I was very taken with it. The best part of the IB is the fact that there is breadth built into it. So you have to study maths. You have to study a modern foreign language. You have to study a humanity. You have to study an art subject. And you have to study the literature of your mother tongue. Um, there are only two countries in the world that don't insist that you study the literature of your mother tongue until you finish school. One of them is Botswana, and the other one is us. Amazing. So there's a really interesting breadth. There are two other courses as well. There's something called um, an extended essay, which is compulsory. Everyone has to do one. It's a proper research project. And there's also a unit called Theory of Knowledge. It's a branch of epistemology in which the children are asked or taught how to consider how they know things. So on what basis do we claim knowledge? reason or perceptual knowledge or intuitive knowledge or the knowledge through language. It's, it's very interesting. I love teaching it. The other advantage of the IB is that when you do a various different qualifications, because people from different countries and different contexts do different ones, they get UCAS points. And the IB provides you with a lot of UCAS points. If you do well in it, you get loads. There are several downsides, though in my view, and that's why we don't do it here. One of them is that the universities most of our children aspire to go to don't make offers based on UCAS points. They make offers based on grades. So I say, oh fine, okay, you want to come to Clever Clogs University to read law, um, you're doing A-levels, fine, we want you to do three A's. If they discover you're doing the IB, they say, oh great, we want you to get 42 points and a seven in English. Which is incredibly difficult, statistically far more difficult to get in three years. So in my school, where we had some children who were doing A-levels wanted to go to Oxbridge, for example, some doing IB wanted to go to Oxbridge, the A-level lot got in, and the IB lot more often than not didn't. There was a real concern I had about it. The other issue, and it's more important, I think, for us, is that doing six subjects plus these other compulsory elements is just so much stuff. To do well in the IB, you really need to be doing between 24 28 hours of work outside the classroom a week. I count that up, especially if you're playing first level hockey and you play grade 8 clarinet and you want to be in the play and you want to be a prefect and you want to do the devices to Westminster canoe race. You're going to die. And you really do have to put those numbers of hours in to succeed in it. Now, for North London Collegiate School, where all the girls have got an IQ of 150 and they just love homework, uh, it's perfect. But I think for a lot of our lot, it isn't. And my anecdote that swings this for me most of all, we had a lovely, lovely boy here a couple of years ago called Ali McManus. Ali was 
great. He was a really lovely, lovely guy. He did uh, science A-levels, but he did one humanities subject as well, I think. And he was going to do uh, one of our EPQs, our Extended Project Qualifications. We'll hear a bit more about these in a bit. But there are a version of the extended essay. And at the beginning of the summer holidays, he came to see me and said, I'm all set to do my research, and I'll, I'll, good luck, and I'll see you next term. During the summer holidays of the lower sixth form, he got the opportunity to go and get some work experience in the hospital at Basingstoke. And he went and worked for uh, a consultant on oncologist. I get ontology and oncology muddled up. Oncologist is cancer specialist. And he spent four weeks with this doctor. And at the beginning of the following term, he came and saw me and said, it was just life-changing. I now know I want to be a hospital doctor. I want to be a consultant. And I'm going to get into medical school. I need an A star, two A's, and I'm going to gun it. I said, good luck, Ali. Fantastic. But, by the way, sir, I didn't do my extended essay. I couldn't do my EPQ. Fine, ditch it. Not a problem. Had he been doing the IB, he wouldn't have been able to do the work experience because he would have had to do the extended essay. There's just no flexibility in the system at all. Whereas the way we do things with A-levels, there's an awful lot of other things you can do. They're accessible to all of ours. They really are. But if you are super bright, we can teach miles beyond them without being constrained by other bits and bobs that just bog you down. And uh, I remember the guys finishing the IB and uh, very often sort of weeping with relief and fatigue. And it was just nose to the grindstone for two years. And it was pretty miserable, actually. So we don't have to put up with that sort of nonsense. Um, as far as Cambridge pre-use, A-levels, which boards we do, etc., etc., it's really up to our heads of departments. Um, Jackie and I say to the heads of departments, what is the most interesting, exciting A-level course out there? Um, and if you believe in it and think you can teach it fantastically, well, we'll do it. Um, and of course, there is also life beyond that. But I so want our youngsters to have time and the enthusiasm to read their own books sometimes. That's not on the syllabus. Just read it because it's there and because they want to and because they're curious. Uh, and we have the time and the space and the tutorial support to encourage the children to be curious like that uh, in a way that really works for us beautifully. Um, we want all of your darling children to stay because um, we've, we've spent a lot of time with them, uh, learning about them, and we know them pretty well. But also we have inculcated into them a really important sense of what our values are and how things work here. And the sixth formers join the grown-ups in this school, they help us. They help us to manage the youngsters, and they help us to carry forward all the things we're trying to do about character education and about what really matters. Um, and, and these guys will, will back that as part of what their role is. They're conscious of it. So it's important to us that we carry the culture from the fifth form through into the sixth form, because it's because that happens that we're the school we are, in my view. So, really, they're all welcome. So welcome. On that note, I'm going to pass on to Jackie, who's going to take you through our presentation and some of the bits and bobs. Um, ALs have changed a lot since I did them uh, and you did them. So if you don't have older children, listen carefully. It's not quite the same as it used to be back in the 80s. Um, I'm going to talk to you about academic issues and A levels. I appreciate some of you will have been through this process before with sons and daughters, um, but for some of you, this is the first time. Um, and there, there are lots of um, things which you need to consider. It's not an easy road, um, but the more thinking about it, the more discussing you do, the better the decision is going to be at the end of the day. So the first question that I think a lot of parents will ask is, how many A-levels um, do, do, do pupils normally do? So how many subjects at AS level and how many subjects at A2 level? The norm is that pupils will study four subjects at AS level, so that's the lower sixth year. And normally they would drop one of those subjects at the end of the lower sixth year and carry on with just three through to what we call A2 level. An A level is made up from an AS component and an A2 component. For some pupils, studying three subjects at AS in the lower sixth is the right decision. Um, and we do have a number of pupils who do do that. And the idea there is that doing three subjects and doing them well is better than doing four subjects and not doing them quite as well. 
In terms of the results at the end of the two years, um, and even at the end of the lower sixth, the calculation of the results um, is, is a bit of a mystery, um, but it's all based on something called UMS. UMS points um, are, are a way of trying to grade each module uh, in a way that makes sense to people, no matter what subject you're studying. Some subjects will have three module exams, some subjects will have two. For some subjects, the UMS total for the three exams may be 300, and for other subjects, the UMS total may be 200, or maybe something else completely different. So the total UMS points available uh, for an AS level or an, the A2 component will vary from subject to subject. But to keep it simple, um, the, there, there are boundaries put in, and the idea is that if a pupil scores 80% of the UMS points available, then that is equivalent to a grade A. And 70% is a B, and 60% is a C. So when pupils sit module exams, they will see the breakdown, and they'll be able to tell how well they've done in grade terms in each of those modules. But at the end of the day, um, the pupils will gather points, and they essentially cash those points in, and they collect their grades from those points. For an A star, this was introduced a couple of years ago, um, this is only available for subjects that have carried through for two years, and to qualify for an A star, a pupil must gain 80% UMS overall, so a grade A, and they must gain 90% of the points in the A2 modules. So that is pretty demanding, but that's how an A star is calculated. How should the decision be made regarding subjects? It's a long process, and what we try to do here is to show you the steps that we take with the pupils to try to make sure that they make an informed decision. So we start in September with lots of careers guidance. Sharon Ulmark, our careers coordinator, does lots of work with them in their PSHE set, their lessons. Um, Last night we did work with them um, looking at A-levels, introducing them, subject talks, and the pupils took away with them their options booklets. So they've had an introduction to A-levels regarding the subjects. You're having an introduction to A-levels regarding the overall system. September, October time, um, we carry out Cambridge profile testing, which is a mixture of psychometric testing and also linking skills and um, interests to potential careers. Um, this is a really valuable test. We cannot run this ourselves, but we uh, bring in professionals to, to run this sort of testing. So your sons and daughters may well be um, part of that Cambridge profile testing uh, in the next few weeks. In November, then, the pupils who undergo Cambridge profile testing will have individual interviews with, again, experts um, to look at possible career options. Um, and along with, along with that, we'll be running um, application workshops and CV writing preparation, all of that sort of thing, in order to prepare them for life beyond school and beyond university. Jumping to January then, the mock exams will be over and done with. They happen at the end of this term. Um, so there'll be feedback there from teachers. And that's your opportunity to really ask whether this subject is right for your son. Or daughter. We also will have a meeting with tutors and again that gives you an opportunity to sit down with a person who knows your son or daughter best uh, to really think about the subject combinations and is this the right combination for that particular person. So that takes us to January. We have a number of talks um, regarding university choices, um, options beyond sick form. Um, Sharon runs a lot of those on Thursday evening particularly. Um, so throughout January, lots of talks regarding that. And February half term, I'll be asking the pupils what subjects they would like to study at AS level. So this is just the start, and really we've got through to February to make these decisions. Uh, in March, for interest, uh, we run the LWC Careers Fair, where 30 Stonians and parents uh, come in to help us, and uh, there are stalls set up in Sutton Sports Hall, and the pupils go up, and they learn about a whole range of different types of careers and opportunities. 
So we do a lot of work with the fifth form uh, to prepare them for making these decisions and um, equipping them for um, life beyond college. As you can see, the journey involves many, many discussions. We shouldn't be making those decisions for the pupils. The pupils should be making those decisions themselves. But the only way that you can reach a good decision is by being informed. And the way that the pupils can become informed, and yourselves as well, is by talking. Sharon is always available for the pupils during school time, and she's available for parents as well. So if you want to come and talk to her, then drop her an email and she'll make an appointment for you to come in and have a chat. Uh, the Careers Library is open every lunchtime for the pupils. How, um, what sort of steps should you take then when it comes to trying to choose your subjects? It doesn't really matter where on this grid you start. I'm going to start at the top with interest, uh, but actually you could start at any of those points. It clearly is very important that the pupil is interested in the subject. They're going to be studying on timetable, three to four hours a week, and then they're going to be doing independent work outside the classroom for another three to four hours per week per subject. And on top of that, we would expect them to do some reading around. So clearly, to spend that amount of time on that subject, they must be interested in that subject. They should enjoy the subject for the same reasons. They're going to be spending a lot of time looking at the content of that subject. Ability is really important. There is no point in a pupil embarking upon an A-level course if we know that they're going to really struggle. So choosing the right A-level courses for pupils is really, really important. And when you talk to the teachers in January following the mock exams, that's the sort of question that you really want to be asking. Will my son or daughter be able to cope with this subject at A-level? Um, there's nothing worse than spending hours and hours a week doing a subject that you really cannot understand. University and career aspirations clearly are very important. If you want to go into medicine, you must study chemistry and biology. Um, and two other good academic subjects at A-level, I would say ideally in extra science, but other people may argue with me. Um, but a really, you know, a really good um, science combination for medicine. And other careers will have likewise... Um, certain combinations of subjects that are preferred. The fourth A-level may be either a supportive type subject or it could be a broadening subject. What do I mean by that? In the good old days, people used to study things like chemistry, physics and maths. That was a fairly traditional combination of subjects. Um, and now our pupils have got the opportunity of adding to that um, combination, a subject which takes them beyond that sort of um, area of syllabus, so maybe French or geography or drama or something like that. So that would be a broadening subject. Or maybe they want to choose a fourth subject which is supporting. So they may choose chemistry, physics and maths is where I really want to go with my A-levels. Um, but on top of that, I know that biology will support my chemistry, and I quite like biology, so maybe I'll have biology as my AS subject. So the fourth subject may be a supporting subject, or it may be a broadening subject. ASs were introduced oh, many years ago now, um, with the idea of broadening the education of the pupils. For some pupils it does, but not for everybody. Some pupils just decide to go with a subject that supports rather than broadens. Final two questions then, why um, study for A-levels at LWC? We believe that our curriculum is rigorous, traditional subjects are what we um, offer. The reason we offer traditional subjects is that they enable our pupils to go into university, which is what most of our pupils want to, to do. Um, the option blocks which we um, run on the timetable <coughs> allow all sorts of different combinations of subjects. <coughs> so, Almost everything is possible, not quite, okay, but almost every combination of subject is possible. We have small class sizes, you're aware of that already, you know LWC well, and our teachers do go the extra mile to providing individual attention for the pupils. Um, also, obviously, we provide lots and lots of very good, strong pastoral support. I'm sure you're all aware of the amount of pastoral support that your sons and daughters are receiving. Our 
And just to touch briefly on the EPQ, not every school offers the EPQ. We do. This is the extended project qualification. And it's uh, basically a research project where pupils choose the title of their, of, their, of their own choice, completely free choice. It has to extend from the subjects they're currently studying. So it cannot be um, based on topics which they are studying already. It must be something different. It could be linked, but it must be different. Um, and the idea is that they go away, they read, they critically look at their sources of information, they analyse those sources, and then they present their findings and they write up a, a report, a proper academic report, which is referenced. Um, it's a really demanding um, project, but the universities love it because it shows real independence. So we offer the EPQ. Um, lots of really good titles have been um, have been looked at through the EPQ programme. Finally, we add quite a lot of value to our pupils. Now, what do we mean by this? When pupils embark upon the A-levels, we baseline test them. We use tests which are carried out by the University of Durham, and from those tests, predictions are made for the grades that the pupils may achieve. And then we look at the grades that we actually achieve, and obviously, if those grades are higher, then we've added value. So this is our graph for last summer, not 2013, but 2012. Um, and this is our value added compared to all schools nationally. What it shows is that we are in the top 14% <coughs> of schools nationally in terms of the value that we add. So I'm really pleased with that. I think that's a stunning result. Um, you may say, okay, well that includes state schools and maybe naturally independent schools should do better than state schools and I would certainly support that argument. Um, but there's a graph also that looks at the value we add compared to independent schools, again nationally, national independent schools, um, and here we are in the top 25% of independent schools. So I think we deliver a fantastic A-level programme. It's rigorous, it allows our pupils to go to university, we offer a huge amount of support in the classroom and that results in some, some fantastic achievements in terms of um, the grades that we achieve with our pupils. I'm going to pass over to Chris Radman now, who's going to talk a little bit more about the pastoral side of school. Thank you very much. And Sharon. <laughs> this is Sharon. <laughs> Chance to chat to Sharon um, as well as to our um, esteemed guests, the sixth form. So, probably the most valuable part of the evening will be your uh, QA with, with our sixth form students. I'm just, just starting with a question. Um, chatting to my low sixth, my new tutees on Monday, <coughs> I'm going to ask you what, what do you think they said was the biggest change, the biggest difference from uh, the fifth form to, to, to the sixth form at, at LWC? So, any hands, please? Yes. Got to be getting into lunch early. <laughs> well, it depends. Some, some lessons do. So if, if you, I think most have to wait till about five past one. So some do, though. Uh, no, it's not the refurbished sixth form centre either. Is it here before? Uh, no, but I think um, certainly based on experience, a lot of the boys wearing waistcoats and buttonholes and all sorts of things. I've, I've really enjoyed the. Um, step up to professional life. <coughs> there were girls, I mean, texting uh, pictures of um, clothing to you. I know Marion Eldridge was one house parent over the summer who got them. Um, is this okay? Is this okay? Um, do you think it's all do? Um, so they, they, they do like to look the, uh, the business, definitely. But it wasn't that. Well, I assume it's more time with more focus. I would, I would put that pretty much top of the top of the list. Fewer subjects, you've chosen the subjects, but that, that came second. Um, it was, in fact, the, the relationship with, with the teachers. I was pleasantly surprised. Um, but I think they, they really felt, and um, hopefully this will be borne out by the upper six um, experience, they, they, they really feel that, um, that there is a, a, a sea change in, in that kind of relationship where they, they're treated differently, they respond differently. And I think, as Fergus said <coughs> excuse me, at the beginning, um, very much we are working with them. Um, 
So there's a whole host of areas, all of which feed into um, the sixth form life at LWC. Um, whereas the first and second form might be broadening their experience, dipping a toe in, um, as Gareth has, and folks have looked to develop the character education. The middle school um, are getting a sense of teamwork, a sense of togetherness, so it's, it's more, more cohesive. Um, certainly the sixth form, the culmination of that, um, which again is why we'd be very keen for students to stay on to complete that process, um, very much would be a case of, of leadership. Um, helping to lead the college, taking an active part, working with um, staff and students, and being seen to do so. Um, if we jump forward now to the, well, in fact this time, as we have with the upper sixth, so for your children in two years' time, um, they will be getting ready to, to leave the college. And so much of what they've done, so working with their tutor, working with their journal, um, looking really to investigate and explore and understand the process. Um, uh, the kind of pastoral support offered in houses, all those opportunities which, which are there. <coughs> they'll be leaving with, with, with two, two tickets, one being the personal statement in which they can reflect on all of that and direct it at a particular course for particular universities. Um, and certainly tutors work very closely with pupils in order to produce those, those personal statements. Um, and also the tutor then produces the school reference, so having a thorough knowledge of the student. And I know passing uh, one of Fergus earlier this morning, um, it was incredibly kind of inspiring and, and humbling equally. Um, just the, the depth of knowledge of a colleague of ours who wrote about uh, one of the boys in the, in the epic. Um, he hasn't had a, the easiest time, excuse me, academically, um, but certainly what that reference communicated was an incredible understanding and it even was you know, love of, 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 of that particular, particular child, a, a, a real, you know, fantastic. If I were an admissions teacher reading that, um, I would certainly not simply go on grades, so I would be very keen to um, see what that student had to offer at my university. Um, the personal statement comes to me um, for checking, um, often to and fro with the tutor, and then it goes on to Fergus for um, final approval, the final overview, comes back to me and then goes to, to Shannon Hallmark for uploading on the UCAS site. Um, ideally, too, it, it should be a case that at th that stage of the sixth form, um, sons and daughters should be getting ready to leave the, um, getting ready to leave the college, you know, fully equipped. I've had a vast experience um, and hopefully with lots of friends um, from that supportive environment heading off to be successful um, at university. Currently the dropout rate is, I was quite surprised, is about 10%. 10 um, and we like to think that our students are happily placed um, and definitely have made the right choices and, and will thrive. Um, I'd now like to hand over, and there will obviously be an opportunity to ask questions, but very much a case of handing over to, to the sixth form and the questions directed um, at Sharon um, and me and, and, our, and our sixth formers. Um, as they will try and operate the chair successfully this time, go with, go with the lines if that's it. Yeah. Um, any questions perhaps to um, Sharon or Mark immediately whilst we um, set up the sixth form? Can I ask a question? 10%? That's 10% of the workshops that I run about how to search and look at. We have a, a wonderful admissions tutor come in, uh, ex-admissions tutor from Brunel University, so I hope they're well prepared and I continue to work with them, she says knowingly, um, you know, in, in the upper six. So I hope that we don't, you know, fall into that 10% category. Can I ask you one question, just going back to the academic, comparing the ATS A levels. <coughs> are A levels in these modules you referred to, the AS level build-up, are they purely 
exam bits at the end of the year or at the end of two years, or is there an, an element of ongoing work which counts towards those points? It sort of depends on different courses. For English, um, AS is 40% coursework. Um, we often tell students, perversely, the fewer courseworks when you get to AS. Um, in the upper sixth, uh, one coursework which counts 40%, so obviously 60% examination. And I think there is, a, there is a balance across a range of subjects where that's, that's the case. Changing. If you go likes, likes terminal assessment, I don't know it's so um, So he's, he's moving this towards uh, being assessed at the end of the course. Um, but it's, it's in flux and it changes all the time. And one of the things that we have to do actually is to respond to the changes and see what we think is the best thing for us and did for this lot. Um, it's lovely to be independent. <laughs> we can do what's in our interest. It's great. Um, I wouldn't sort of swap out from it for any money. Should we move on to this one? Do you want to take time to introduce yourself? Maybe say what subjects you're doing. Um, so, because I think we've got a broad range, and then we'll, we'll take it straight into that. So, Sam, do you want to start? With you? Uh, I'm Sally Mohammed. I'm one of the heads of college this year, and I'm currently studying chemistry, biology, and Spanish. And I'd love to be in medicine. Uh, my name is Nicola Collinson. I'm head of Gosden House, and I'm studying psychology, business, and art. Uh, Lizzie Hayward. Uh, I'm joint head of Park House, and I'm studying maths, further maths, physics, and chemistry. I'm Laura McVean. I'm prefect here, and I also do drama, English, economics, um, and yeah, I'm making to do drama at the university. Far away, guys. What do you want to know? <laughs> Question about language A levels. In my day, as I keep saying to my children, the language A level switched from very much sort of language based at O level to A level became more literature based. Is that still true? Right, my own language. Yeah. Um, well, AS, um, it was purely language. So you just, your basic you just get so much better at it. Um, A2, you build on a language, but then you do some literature, you do some films, you study. I think you can take a pick um, with your class. So I think we might do a director and that sort of thing, so you can do films and literature. I think it is very different, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I did O level French a long time ago. Didn't speak a word of the language. That wasn't really relevant. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> uh, I, I read some Flaubert, uh, as far as I can, I can recall. Um, and it's very much more a question of, of can you can you converse? Can you use it? It's, it's for that sort of utility purpose these days, um, which is a good thing, is it not? Um, and if you do have a subject of the language, then you can you can begin to approach the uh, the literature of the subject afterwards. Which of course is what language is based based about. about but quite a lot of our pupils go on to study modern languages at university here. Uh, because we've got a very strong department in that sense. And it's a good thing, actually. Good question. Yeah. Can I ask about, you were saying that, that the children discuss what options they want to take in February. What flexibility is that if in August they say, do you know what, I don't want to do those anymore, I want to do these? That's a really good question. Is Jackie here? Do you want yeah. to um, As long as it fits in to the timetable, and there's room in the groups that uh, the, the person wants to transfer into, then that's absolutely fine. It could be left until September, and yeah, suddenly yeah. they... But obviously it must fit into the yeah, timetable yeah. that the defendants in. A number of pupils do do that. I'm trying to cut down on the number of pupils that do do that because it's... It must, have a, a, it must depend to a degree, though, on the results that they're going to get at, at GCSE level, though, as to what they're allowed to study. Do you have criteria as to what they're allowed to study? We do to some extent. Really, can I ask these guys why they chose the subjects they did and follow by answering subsequent to that? Do any of you want to answer that? Why did you, why did you want to study sciences you did, Lizzie? Because you were um, pretty good at everything. <laughs> That's you. Um, I've always been interested in science. Like, partly I think that I am interested in it because it's my, one of my best subjects. But also... Um, you didn't want to write essays, did you? No, I, I've, nev I've never liked writing essays. I was quite glad when I finished English. But okay. Is it because of what you want to do afterwards? You no, I have no, I, you have no idea what you want to do afterwards. What I'm actually applying for at university is maybe economics or psychology, so it's actually nothing to do with the sciences, but it's just what I was interested in. Like, I didn't know for, until like 
summer, what I wanted to do, and then... Okay, Laurie, what about you? What about your choices? Um, in terms of my choices, I was set on two of them because they're like what I love the most, which is drama and English. They're two subjects I really enjoy. I suppose they link hand in hand. And then in terms of like, psychology and economics, um, it's the, the two favourite subjects. I tried to find subjects that I could almost try and marry with them. So psychology, I had a great interest in that. Going to the talks, listening to Miss Faulkner, um, I, I, it just sparked a curiosity within me. So I felt then that that married nicely with English and drama especially. So that was a set choice then. And then economics, which I carried on this year, strangely. Um, I, I chose that as the last option because I went to the talk and it was again just this curiosity I had about what economics offered and about society. Um, and although it may sound strange to say it married nicely with English and drama, I feel it really did because in terms of psychology there's so much to understand um, in economics from psychology. And yeah, I, it was just taking things I really enjoyed and had curiosity in and doing them and finding out I really did enjoy them. They're all about the peculiar behaviour of human beings. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I was set on art. I was always told to do subjects I enjoyed for A level so I could carry on with them and not get bored or anything like that. Was that so, right, eventually? Yeah, I was right to take on subjects that I enjoyed because otherwise I didn't think I'd be motivated to work hard. But um, so I was set on art when I took that. My love for art came out in pretty much fifth form, so I was like, definitely going to take that. Um, business and psychology, obviously, two new subjects I'd never studied before, but. I think it was mainly when I went along to the talk, I had heard so much about it from the years above and I'd heard it was really interesting what I'd heard about. I was like, yeah, I think I could do that, I think I'd be interested in that. And then I was, went along and talked to Miss Faulkner, talked to Miss Delay and um, Mr. Walker And I was like, yeah, okay, this is good, this is what I can do. And I, yeah, I enjoyed taking it, it was a right choice. Yeah. Was that prescribed for you by the fact you wanted to do medicine? Or have you discovered um, that subsequently? Well, I thought I knew I wanted to do medicine. Um, and I really like biology at GCSE, just the human biology. Um, and so I kind of knew I needed to take those two. Um, but then Spanish, I just, I just kind of love it. So I took it because I really enjoy it. And I'm really, really glad I did. Um, it's absolutely key. We are really lucky in this country that the way in which our whole education model works is that do what you love. The pupils who, from my experience, have chosen the wrong A-level, or the wrong university courses are they done it one because I got an A in geography but I only got a B in history I love history I really think geography is boring but I got an A in geography so I better carry on just in case I get another A no do what you love if you love Spanish do Spanish and the other thing that sometimes goes wrong is dad tells me that economics is really useful and I ought to do that do you ever read a newspaper no I'm not really interested in that at all I, I really love poems but you know, dad says economics is going to be useful do what you love, because you're going to put hours and hours and hours into it. And if you do a levels you love, then likely <coughs> will take you in the path to a university course that you'll love, which are likely to take you into a working life that you'll love. And the theme is loving it all the time. So I, I don't think that's at all the wrong way to go. We don't encourage last-minute conversions based on the fact that it's slightly better in one GCC than another. Because that sort of visceral choice of, you know, it's break time. What have I got next? Great, I've got double German. I love German. Do German. They can think, ooh, chemistry. Um, don't do chemistry. I think building on something um, Ms. Livingston just said, when you take a subject that you really love, at AS and A2, you're putting so many hours into the subject that if you really love it and you want to put those hours in, then the grades will be good. I, I think that's quite clear with people that do get good grades. When they love the subject, generally the grades are just a follow-on from that. Um, yeah, definitely. I talk to li lots of little boys who come and see me, uh, prospective pupils, and they say, what, what are you good at? I say, drop kicks. Really good at drop kicks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what are you not good at? Songs. Don't have no so, How much time do you spend on drop kicks? Oh, I practice all day. <laughs> how much time do you practice? I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, switch it around, it would be very different. So, it, he should be doing A-level with drop kicks. It's the same, I think, equivalency for this thing. The things they're passionate, the things they're really passionate about, then they work harder than they realise they're working. If it's a subject they really don't like, even if they think they're doing quite a lot, they're probably not. Good question. Thank you. Let me ask you one, and this is this is a tough one. Miss Hampshire's unusual, to my knowledge, in so far as there are six.
which fluctuates and that conversation goes on in the house, my crazy going X or whatever. This is the master's question. <laughs> <laughs> what, what weighed up some of that decision, assuming it wasn't your parents saying you're going to stay at the LWC and that's a place for you? Um, well, I actually was going to college. I actually went to college for the first day of college and then decided to come back to Wandsworth. Because, yeah, a lot of my friends went to college and to an extent you are definitely influenced by them because if there's none of your friends here, you're not going to enjoy it as much. But they can't make the decision for you. Like, I wanted to try new things. I was like, yeah, school. Like, everyone's like, I want to move on. I want to be older. And I, like, I wanted to do that. But then when I got there, I'm like, it's not as big as you think it is. Like, you realise that actually there's so much stuff that Laws and Laws offers that the colleges don't, particularly sport. Like, I like hockey and... If I had gone to college, I would not have continued with hockey because they don't force you into it. Like the college system, they don't make you do anything. And like, although those ones that do make you do it, it's for the best because you think like I actually do want to do this, but I might not do it if it was just myself. So. I think another thing as well is if you stay here. Um, like a lot of my friends then left to college. Um, I was left here, and then. But once you get into the sixth form, it's completely different. You've all changed over the fifth form summer, and you come back and you're with people that are completely transformed, and you make completely new friends. And I'm friends with people that when I was in the fifth form, I thought to myself, I could never be friends with them, not in a million years. And now I'm in the sixth form, and I invite them around my house, and I want to do things with them. And it's, it's a bit weird, but that fifth form summer is a big growing up period for everyone, I think. And some people will suit college, but for me, one of the best decisions I've ever made today here because I made new friends that... Like I said, I never thought I could be friends with. Thank you. When, when you go into the sixth form, do you find what is what is the relationship with your tutor? Does that change? Um, well, is, how important is that? Do you want to try Well, I'd love to hear all of you actually. In the sixth form, you, you choose your tutor. Yeah. Um, so you get a choice of three and. I think everyone got one of their top choices. So you see your tutor almost every day, and now I think we all realise that it's really, really important to be with a tutor because you're constant now when we're writing personal statements, you're constantly checking ideas about your personal statement. Should I be doing this sort of work experience? And yeah, it's a very really important system. Uh, yeah, and no, I think relationship has to be good. You have to get a uh, tutor that you'd want to have because you do, yeah, like Sarah said, you do see them every day, registering with them, go to them whenever you need them, um, talk through stuff. I think it's quite good. I've got my art teacher as my tutor, so like now I've decided I want to go to art college. It's helping me through that. Um, yeah, and it, it's probably, yeah, it's good to have a tutor that you like, but everyone, yeah, gets a choice of who they want. I think what you don't think about as well with college, like what I worked out with college is that you're, you're just allocated a tutor. Your tutor has about 30 tutees that, do, that he doesn't particularly know, you don't particularly know them. Whereas here, like, you do get to know your tutor really well and they like, become really like, personal with you, so they really understand and they know what's best for you as well. So I think it's really helpful. Tutor, it sounds a bit funny to say they always become another parent, but I think definitely um, having my tutor there, he's someone that I can go to when I'm emotionally maybe upset, but also if I've got some academic problem, and you go to them, and a friend would be the wrong way to call it, but it's somebody you can talk to and be quite frank with, um, and they'll understand what you're trying to say. And uh, from my tutor, they sort out when I have a problem, and they're there for me when I need them to be there, and then when I don't need them and I can drive myself, then they do take that step back. So they're not always on your case, but when they need to be on your case, they're there. Um, yeah. I'm pretty glad to hear this. It sounds to me like I feel rather the same. I was at a lovely school, I had a lovely sick form. And uh, my tutor became a friend. He was at my wedding and he's still a friend of mine. I've seen him every six months after. So, lifelong friendship was a Sorry, when did you say you choose your tutor? What stage is that? Chris, talk us through. Yeah, we've we tried in recent years to make that <coughs> choice very, very quick so that they don't start sick form life with, with tutors. Um, so, it's very much after the, as we get to the first weekend. Um, an email comes from me to uh, to the sixth saying, "Could you please <coughs> your top three or four from the following list of people who agreed and would like to be tutors?" Um, those emails come to me. I collate a sheet of 
choices one to three, um, and then working with uh, Fergus and with Gareth, looking at staff allocation, looking at um, who, you know, which of the oversubscribed tutors, um, and trying to just have a have a fair balance, um, and looking also at the dynamics of the tutor group itself. So, and, and are these tutors normally um, teaching that particular student that subject, we would, not necessarily. Not necessarily, but we would, we would have some sort of natural, I believe, natural point of contact. So, it might, might be a hockey coach, a rugby coach, could well be um, a teacher in the in the house, um, academic teacher. So someone who is seen as a, as a natural part of the day, uh, but also someone with whom the TT has, has an affinity. So so a small it's school. It's so yeah. Absolutely. So that we do know each other. It's a balance to be struck. You may think you have a completely free choice over all of the teachers in the school. But in fact, they don't, because um, there are a number of staff who are natural choices for the sixth form. Um, and there are differences <coughs> between tutoring the first form and the third form. Fifth form and sixth form, and some of our some of the members of staff are absolutely brilliant. And David Perry from the second form, I mean, he's brilliant. But he's just that's his completely his thing. Uh, we've got other members of staff, like Graham Smith and, and Chris himself, and um, Graham was the author of the, uh, the reference I read this morning that was also affected by. Just a brilliant, brilliant reference. He's so captured him, so new was Charlie Drummond, um, there's Steve Badger, etc., etc. So there are a group of of 15 to 20 of the teachers here who are the sixth form teachers that we allocate. Uh, and you rather get the impression that they're the ones you necessarily chose. Well, a good impression down uh, It tends to work out that way. Great, the same as no one. Um, so it's a, it's a group of them. And they are pretty experienced at it. They've done it for a while. And they know what works in, in those references and in terms of the relationship with the people. And the students are quite canny too. But they know if they need a rock line as a tutor like Mr. Smith, then <laughs> usually they request them. They request Mr. Smith. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very fine balance too, because we also want to give the students a sense of independence, preparing them for university life. So it's not as though stay at LWC, you'll be smothered in cotton wool, um, and then off you go. Um, it, it, it is a fine balance to the strong. Good question. Any more? Just what, one of the um, rationales you put for choosing the ones with as a sixth form college was a small class size. What, what size? Do you deem to be a small class size? We have as a maximum of about 16. We right. do have one of our job groups in about 6 to 17. Um, but that's, that's an absolute maximum number for us. Um, down to threes and fours and twos and possibly even one people. Um, that's not ideal. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we want yeah. to get a little group of you. Um, but not going to be a bit of a bit of So our average uh, sixth form class size is 11. And that's just great. And if they get too big, we'll split them and have two. Um, that's, that's what we did mass this year. We have How many in Challenge expedition to Norway, and 
I've really loved it, so that made me take on Golgi Fedora and that sort of thing. So that's kind of like more leadership. And then being an upper six, we get offered the chance to be a prefect or a head of house or a head of college. So I think that's quite made everyone really step up and like, Can you take play the flute? Yeah. To what level? Yeah. Um very seven. Yeah, I pretty much spend my like majority and like my heart will go into the art department. So I take opportunity of all the trips that they do, like everything they supply and for you. So, but um, I've, I've tried other things. I tried like DAV, it wasn't really my thing. But um, yeah, you can just get into whatever you want and it's nothing like too intense, but like really strict, you have to stick with it. So you can try multiple different things and see what is really your type your area and then carry on with that so yeah. what about you? Uh, I'd say that you here you end up doing a lot of stuff that you wouldn't do normally like I have just come from an ensemble practice for house singing I cannot sing to save my <laughs> life and having to teach third formers how to harmonize is possibly one of the most difficult things for me <laughs> but it's such like it's given me such a skill like drawing on areas that I haven't done music since I was like 14 but it's made me like delve back into that and draw up a lot of areas that I have not explored in a while, which I think is quite nice. Well, with extracurricular stuff, I suppose, I, I picked up everything I wanted to do in the first form up to the fifth form. I was doing a, a load of different things, playing every sport I could, doing drama. Um, there, was, there was a lot of different things on. And then getting to sixth form, um, which I suppose has already been discussed, I then realised that I, what I enjoyed was drama, I enjoyed playing rugby, and that was my two main areas, and I enjoyed working with people within the school, uh, within the house, or just trying to change things that people wanted to be changed, I was trying to help them with that. Um, so getting into the sick form, due to the, all the extracurricular activities I've done, I then got to the sick form and I thought, okay, right, I want to put my own play on, um, I want to get involved in every production that's on, I want to try and get into the firsts. Um, There's just some goals I set for myself, um, but also by doing all these extracurricular things before, <coughs> I then had an understanding of how the school worked and I had an understanding of how different people function within like, this little society, I suppose. Um, so with drama, I, I can work with people, I know they've got a lot on their plate and there's, there's, just, there's a lot of understanding that goes on just by doing all these extracurricular stuff. Um, and now I really enjoy it and being in the sixth form it just gives me this opportunity to lead all the things I enjoy, which is drama, which is the main one. I just love leading them, I love taking workshops, I love getting involved in all the plays, trying to stand up and help people when they're struggling um, and yeah I suppose I found my calling in that. <laughs> what influence do you feel you have over the school and the over us and over the way it's managed and the way it's run and things? Do you feel a part of actually its direction and its management too? and you're going to have a lot of influence within the houses and the different years that you support with them. But obviously if you're a prefect, a lot of people are looking up to you. You've got the whole school. That prefect just did a video in assembly, so everyone knows who they are. Like They're definitely a role model for them. And obviously head of college, and you've got a lot of influence over everything. So. I think it's true of all of the sick form, actually. It's not just the prefects. Um, I go on and on about the fact that so often the best prefects aren't actually prefects. Um, but the sick forms who are good at um, being compassionate and listening to and, and caring for youngsters. Um, and the influence they have on the youngsters is absolutely priceless. If we were to lose our sick form, uh, our fifth, fourth, third and youngsters would be incredibly diminished and impoverished by that absence because they are um, they are ever present in the kind of school. It, it, it's not just to be this is all of them. Um, they lead uh, in a way that uh, is, is priceless, I think. It's just an interesting opportunity to me. The concentration of opportunities here is, is phenomenal in the sixth form, actually. I've just come from a much bigger school, uh, Wellington College, which is about 1,050 kids. There's as many opportunities to lead here as there are there, about the same number. But then if you look at it, if you do the math, that means the opportunities per child here are fantastic. There's so few of them, so many different avenues and areas that they can influence. Um, 
I've been quite taken aback by the concentration of opportunity at LWC to take ownership of your school and your little bits of school, so be it drama or music or whatever. At Wellington, some had a big influence, I and mean, then lots of kids, if I'm honest with you, they didn't. They just kind of went to the school so big, they just kind of went through. And being a sixth form, it wasn't that much different than a fifth form, really. Um, that's some, just an observation from me, who's relatively new, and to make a comparison with another private school that you may have heard of. Um, so, huge strength of the school. Because can I say something as well? Sorry to butt in as well, but I think these four are actually hiding their lights under a bush a little, little bit. Um, and they've said a lot of things that they do, but some things they have <coughs> sort of omitted, and it's probably because it's part of their life and haven't quite realised how much they do do. Something like Laurie in drama, and he said how much he loves drama. For instance, the sixth form now, the drama students are going out to other schools and doing workshops with younger children. And they have taken it upon themselves to do whole programmes, along with the help of, of um, Vic Allen, head of drama, to do that. And it's a massively successful um, and it gives them a great strength. Somewhere like Sadia as well is going to Ghana. We have the Ghana project, uh, which goes every two years um, to go and work with uh, children out there. We have a partnership with the school. Um, so there are things, I think they, they do these things without even thinking about it. Um, and also, there's, some of them are departmental prefects. We haven't mentioned that, have we? In the sixth form, there's departmental prefects in all the departments. Um, and those students then help the younger students. So they'll help run clinics. They'll help do teaching. Are there any of you departmental prefects? I'm sure. Yeah. Some yeah. 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 So they, they haven't they mentioned that. And it's a big thing. <laughs> well, I'm pretty much always in the old one anyway. So <laughs> 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 well, when I can, I can be. So I'm... Um, like other classes come in, obviously six when you've got your own working space, so other classes come in, can ask you whatever they want, and you're just like one big class, like one big like community in art. Um, but obviously there's like separate clubs on different evenings, like different afternoons that you can help out with. But yeah, it's just planning what you want to do for, to help other years. Okay, one. It's possibly the same question you said in terms of those things do you feel you have in school? What, if any, things do you think the sixth form could do better or what would be better in the sprint of the last two years? And maybe if you've got sufficient influence, there isn't something. So what could we do better as a sixth form? No, what could, is there anything you feel the sixth form could offer or should offer that you're lacking effectively or is everything there? Offer to you. Thank you. Right. Yeah. I think since we have a sixth form committee that um, Mr. Rasmussen helps lead as well. But so if any... If there is anything that you wanted doing or like extra, then mm -hmm. go to the sit form committee. There's a direct link to teachers, which is a direct link to headmaster who can get stuff done. Um, but no, I think because the, one of the main things was our sit form centre, that was we all wanted that to be refurbished and that was over the summer and we came back to that. So I think if there was anything that we could think of, it would be told to the teachers and would be sorted. I think also, like, it's often what. We don't like ask for stuff to be given to us because in the sixth form you learn to like do everything for yourself and like a lot of things like the teachers don't want to provide you with too much because after sixth form you're going to be on your own. So we kind of learn to like provide for ourselves and like work out what we want to do for ourselves and stuff. So how so how well prepared do you guys feel now going in, into the upper sixth for life beyond the sixth form? And, and I'm talking about not not academically, but you know you're going to be thrown out into the real world this time next year. I think part of the thing as well, when you get into the upper sixth, I, I've certainly found this. The fact that I'm, I've enjoyed my time here, and I, I, I still enjoy my time here, but the fact that I'm looking forward to leaving now, I think that says a lot, because I, I, I feel prepared now, I'm not scared, I'm not really nervous that I'm going out to this big world. I'm, I'm actually excited for it, I feel prepared. And yeah, I suppose that excitement just shows me personally that I am definitely prepared for that. And it's not to say that we're going to go out there and we're going to overcome every challenge. There is not going to be no challenge. There's still going to be loads of challenges when we go out into the real world, if you want to put it like that. But um, I think the skills we've learned here means when we go out, we can overcome them a lot easier than quite a lot of students that maybe didn't get to experience an atmosphere like this. So there's hope for Hopefully. <laughs> 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 they've gone, they're incredible. And they've developed an independence and a self-confidence here that's carried them through. One of the things I'd put 
to say two things. Firstly, I am the custodian of the foundation here. Uh, it's one of the things I have responsibility for, I said. I'm incredibly proud of it. And the longer I'm here, the more years that go by, the more wise it strikes me that a lot of those, um, those features of the foundation are. The foundation supports children here up to the age of 24. They're beyond their schooling sometimes. Um, and there are youngsters, or traditionally and historically for me, who really needed support beyond school as they got on their feet and found work in the post office or wherever else they, they, <coughs> they found work. And I don't think we do think of, of the leaving sick forms as like that. I mean, they become Sturnians here, and, we, and they're, they're very much part of the family long beyond the point at which they finish with us. And I, we certainly think of them in those terms. The other thing I think is so important, I don't know if it's a crack record, Sally's heard me say this five times this year, is that so often that the, the legacy of our sick formers is not for them. You don't plant orchards for yourself, you plant them for your next, uh, your children. And the sick form centre, the incentive to get that done was Laurie Simpleton. He went on and on and on and on and on about it. We didn't have any resource at the time, we were building this. Um, but it, the seed was planted in here, and a couple of years later, we recognised how important it was, and Chris advocated for it, and then we put some resources. And I said, thanks, Laurie. Um, you, know, you, should be, uh, you should be grateful to him for having got that started. And I have no doubt that during the course of this year, some ideas are going to come out of this group and this year group that will make a difference to you know, the next lot and the lot after. Um, well, your children, actually, probably, from this group, and then your children, Similarly, uh, we'll do things and be conscious of the fact they're making a contribution for uh, the next generation. That's wonderful. Uh, wonderful. They're frustrating that the, the, the time is rather hoping it can happen now. Now, <laughs> but it's a good thing to learn that you can have an influence on those that follow. That's what leadership is all about. Great. Any more? Okay. Well, if you want to revisit any <laughs> any of this, Mary, did you remember to turn it off? It, yeah, I think hope so. <laughs> As a result, um, we will be able to uh, we'll be able to see it again. We're going to hang around for a while. These guys are probably going to press off and get some uh, get some prep done. But if there's anything you want to ask us informally afterwards, then do stay around for, for a while. But thank you all for coming. It was uh, it was really nice to see you. Could I just say, do you have a picture of your envelope yet? There's an envelope um, for each family.